Hello, Dr. Chai. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Sounds good. All right, it's uh, seven o'clock. Let's go and get started. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, pretty good. All right, and so it's uh, Wednesday of, of week eight. And so, you know, we have three more lectures until spring break. So I am definitely counting on the days. Okay. So we have the lectures this week. Um, next week is an ANSYS week. And so we have, um, you know, one lecture and an ANSYS activity. Uh, of course, you know, we have spring break after that, and so I don't plan on having the next ANSYS activity due until after spring break, uh, especially because, you know, I know you guys are still working on the project right now, too. And so, remember, activity four is due on uh, Wednesday of next week, and then, you know, we'll have activity five next week, and then, you know, it'll be due after, after that. Okay. okay, so, you know, just a reminder, you know, make sure you guys are working on the midterm project. And so, if you, uh, you know, if you haven't started yet, you know, definitely, you know, at the very least, you know, try to at least load one of the CAD files, right? So make, you know, you can choose uh, one of the two CAD files, make sure you choose one and, and give it a try, right? Um, you know, I think probably what, probably what we're gonna cover today might be helpful for, for you um, if you're struggling with some of the meshing. And so we'll go over, you know, some of the more advanced meshing features and answers. Uh, maybe that some of that might be helpful for, uh, for you guys uh, looking to mesh your projects. Okay, um, okay. All right, um, I think that's all my announcements. Are there are there any questions I can answer before we get started for today? Oh, I have a few questions, for Dr. Chan. If, if no one uh, inside the class has questions first. Oh, no, go ahead, Ivan. Okay, so uh, I'm just trying to get an understanding of what to expect and to schedule and study accordingly. Yep. Um, so we have the midterm and you gave us approximately a month to work on that. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and uh, we also have uh, assignment number four. Correct. And that's yep. due next week. That's due next yes. week. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm thinking is, so as you mentioned, spring break is the week after uh, next week. Yes. Um, and um, soon thereafter, a, a, approximately a month and a week uh, is left in the in the semester until. The, uh it ends so yep. uh so are, um are we gonna get one month for the final exam and if and if that's the case uh uh that means we should <laughs> obtain the final exam assignment prompt approximately one week or two weeks after spring break is that correct 
Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the final project uh, the first day we come back from, from spring break. Okay. Uh, so you have about, a, a, actually about a month and a half. And so, okay. Um, okay. so the, our instruction ends on week 16. Um, so that's, that's the last day that we'll meet. Oh, I see, I see, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. um, after I that see, is finals week. Um, so we don't meet during finals week and we, and we don't have a final actual written exam. So, you know, we're not taking that. And so what the final project is going to be doing is going to be due the Monday after finals. Week. And so you have basically all the weeks of instruction left, weeks 11 through 16, you have finals week, um, and then it'll be due after that. So it'll be about six weeks for you guys to work on, on the final project. All right, then, sir. I just wanted to get a more thorough understanding. Thank you. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and of course, you know, we'll have other ANSYS activities, too. Um, so I, I, you know, I have eight activities planned for the class. I think the last, the last one I'm, I'm going to make optional just because I know that's, that's kind of crunch time, um, not only for this class, but I know you guys are taking, probably taking other classes too. So the last activity we'll make optional just to make sure you guys have enough time to, you know, do the final project, but also, you know, work on your other final exams and final studying for your other classes too. Um, so we have next week, next week is activity five. After the spring break, we have two activities. Uh, the first two are going to be mandatory. Um, and then the eighth one, which I think, I think we're gonna do that on the very final week of class. Um, that's going to be optional. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, um, I can answer before we uh, get started for today. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off on Monday about advanced meshing. And so on Monday, you know, what we talked about was we, we kind of dived into this idea of mesh quality uh, some more, right? And so, you know, mesh quality is something that we've talked about, you know, in this class before. Um, it has to do with kind of the shape or the orientation of the elements. And so what we did on Monday was we kind of talked more in depth of kind of what effect that can actually have on your solution, um, especially in the, in the neighborhoods of like, you know, high solution gradients um, and, um, you know, what, what that can actually look like. And so kind of the upside or kind of the, the main point that I wanted you to get out of Monday was the fact that, you know, you should, you should be looking at your results, right? And so meshing and simulation is not just kind of a one-shot process. And so, you know, especially when you're kind of in, you know, like, like you guys are, you guys are learning how to use finite elements. Um, you should think about meshing as like an iterative process. And so by iterative, that means that, you know, you should, you should be trying it kind of multiple times and making small adjustments along the way, okay? Um, you know, over time, what you're going to do is that, you know, by, by doing a lot of meshes and, and working with FBA a lot, you know, you're going to build, you're naturally going to build a lot of intuition in terms of, you know, what features kind of work the best for you, what's kind of the best thing to do in certain geometries in certain situations. But, you know, a lot of that kind of implicit um, knowledge takes, takes time to build up, okay? And so until you get there, you know, the, I, I always tell people the best process to go, go through is just to just try stuff. And I think, you know, one thing that people kind of get stuck into or, or kind of a, a habit that people get stuck into is that, you know, you have to kind of make things, you know, perfect the, the first time. Right? Um, and so the, the nice thing about computer software or computer modeling is that you don't, you don't have to make it perfect the first time. You, can, you know, you can try something and you can see how that kind of, um, you know, looks out and then kind of, you know, improve it from, from there. Okay. All right, and so in particular, you know, the one thing I, I, I want you guys to look, look out for, you know, when you're doing the activities, when you're doing the projects, is I want you to look for smooth solution, um, you know, patterns. Um, Dr. Chan, a question popped into my head. Sure. Um, so having said what you said, uh, does that mean that when an engineer runs FEA, uh, he will most likely, when when one runs FEA, it is he always runs, or he or she always runs more than one simulation? It's never just one simulation? Yeah, a lot of times, you know, there's, uh, you're, you're going to be running more than one. Uh, and, and, there's, and there's more reasons than that, than, than, just, than just finding a good mesh. I mean, part of that is, is kind of debugging, right? Um, 
But a part of it also is some, a lot of times you need multiple simulations in order to prove you have a, you, you have a reliable result too. Um, and so one question that you're, you're always going to get asked, you know, whenever you perform any kind of computational work, whether it's finite element, finite difference, or finite volume, is you're going to be asked if your mesh, if your um, results are mesh independent. And so the only way to really prove that is to run like a mesh convergence test. And so just by the nature of a mesh convergence test, you're going to be running multiple simulations anyway. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, some, it's something that's kind of unavoidable and, and it's something that you're going to have to do, you know, for almost for basically anything that, that you do. So, so, so just to make sure I, I'm understanding everything correctly, um, you're saying engineers often get asked if uh, their simulation is, is mesh independent yes. and, and that the answer and the engineer should provide is uh, doing a mesh convergence test, but doing so, um, doesn't doing a mesh convergence test imply that the mesh is dependent on the simulation or am I yes. not understanding that correctly? Of course, of course. I mean, but you, you want to make sure that, you know, when you're reporting results. And so when you say that, you know, I ran a simulation and I found the deformation to be X or I found the stress to be Y, you know, you want to make sure that you produce those results on a mesh that has sufficient uh, refinement. And so what the mesh convergence test does, it shows you, you know, eventually, you know, mesh convergence test, you know, almost yeah, always kind yeah. of looks like this. And so it looks like a point, yeah, you know, I remember a point you where it kind of tailors off, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you report things like the stress, you want to make sure that the mesh that you're using is something like right here, or even better, something like out here, right? So after it's converged. And so that basically tells whoever's reading your report or who's ever interpreting your simulation that your results are reliable and, or they're as reliable as they can be from yeah and actually you know it's 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 a problem that you know almost everyone that works in computations um, runs into is that you know there's there's a saying uh, there's a saying that if you do if you do computational work then you know everyone doubts your solution except for you um, but if you do experimental work then everyone believes your solution except for you and so so, um, the, the Dr. Chan, I don't want to waste the class time because I do, I, I do think about the, 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 the time. But um, the next question that arises is, is having a FEA uh, that is independent of mesh, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Because if we're doing mesh convergence, which implies that it's dependent, I'm assuming um, having a, a mesh, a FEA mesh de dependent, implying mesh convergence is a good thing and a mesh independent result is a bad thing is or oh, they're they're the same thing and so you know uh, when, when you have a, a a mesh convergence plot you know and you and it looks something like this right when we when we when we use a mesh that's kind of right here right we say that that result is converged because if we if we refine the mesh any further then we're not going to get any improvement of the results we're not going to get any change right because it's flattened out and so another way that we can say it, so it's so mesh independence is just another word for kind of converged. And so basically what we say at this point is that the result is mesh independent. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, so mesh independence is, is it's not really the simulation itself. It's just that it's you've reached a certain I see, level of I see it. So that I, if you refine it. I understand it, a bit more clearly now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I think I was just getting confused on the semantic, semantics. Uh, I apologize for the for the inconvenience. Oh, no, no, yeah, don't, don't apologize. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question, right? So it's, it's, there's a lot of terms that's, that's thrown around here. And, and I, I use a lot of jargon just because, you know, I've, I've been in the field for such a long time, but, you know, it's, it's good that you're asking these questions that, you know, we can get these, these straight. Cause I'm sure, you know, whenever you ask a question, there's always at least, I always say there's always at least 10 other people that are asking the same question, but, you know, they just, they're too shy to, to ask. So, you know, um, you know, don't, don't be sorry. You, sh you should be asking questions. That's, that's what, that's what class is for. Thank you, Dr. Tran. Yep. Okay. Um, so anyway, so mesh, so meshing is, is always an iterative process. And, and I want you guys to kind of think of that as, as you're kind of doing your activities and doing your projects. Okay. So the main thing, you know, the main thing I want you guys to look for to see, you know, because because you know, kind of from based on the limitations that we have on the student software, uh, a mesh convergence test is not always going to be the most valid way for you to validate your mesh, even though you know, I just got done talking about mesh convergence testing. Um, because you know, 
basically because, because of the limitations of the student software, you know, a lot of times you're not going to be able to refine enough in order to get that nice plateau region. Right? So what I want you guys to look for instead, and this is and this is a test that you know that is that is run by by you know engineers all over anyway, is to look for smooth solution patterns, right? So you should have smooth transitions from your high stress regions to your low stress regions. You should have smooth transitions from high deformation to your low deformation. Okay. So that's what you should be looking for. And so the process that you guys should be that you, you guys should be um, doing whenever you're meshing is you know something like this. It doesn't have to be exactly this kind of eight-step process, but you know I like to kind of think of it like this. So your first step is always to generate an initial mesh. Okay. And uh, you know some of you have, have actually seen so some of you have actually have actually seen that you know when I when I mesh an object. Uh, or mesh geometry for the first time, I actually don't really fuss with like any kind of method objects or sizing objects. I just go with the default mesh that ANSYS give me, right? And so that's that's always it's just a starting point. So that's not to say that I'm going to use that mesh in the end, but it's always something good to start with. Okay. Step two, of course, is to apply your boundary conditions. And so your that's your loads and constraints. Step three, you're going to run your initial simulation. And so this is, you know, this is probably not going to be the last simulation that you run, but you want to at least make sure that it runs, make sure your boundary conditions are, are valid. Okay. Step four is to look at your results and to identify, you know, what I consider to be areas of concern. Okay, and so you know there there's a few there's a few metrics that you can use for uh, areas of concern. So you know, first thing you can look for is that if, if the solution is, I like to use the term choppy. And so if you have kind of you know rapid oscillations or you see kind of a rapid kind of change, um, that would be an area of concern. Of course, you know, whenever you have areas of high stress concentration, then that, that's always going to be an area of concern as well. Another example might be, you know, we, last time we talked about this idea of structural error, which is the difference between the average and unaveraged results. And so places where you have high structural error, um, that would be another area of concern as well. All right, so you're gonna you're gonna look at your results and you're gonna find the areas with those those problems. Okay. Step five is that after you've identified those areas, is to either refine the mesh or improve the mesh in those areas. And so a lot of times that, that mostly involves just making the elements smaller there. So applying like a local sizing function to make sure that you know you can capture that. Uh, but maybe you want to change the element shape. Maybe you want to choose a different meshing strategy um, in terms of you know whether you want to use you know tets or hexes or you know maybe a different method, or maybe you want to maybe you want to um, change the geometry. Maybe you want to defeature some things. And so we'll talk about that today as well. Okay. And step six, you're going to just run the simulation again. So you're going to see how, how your um, improvements worked. Seven. So step seven is evaluate how much the area is improved. Okay. And then step eight is just repeat. Okay. And so you're gonna go back up to step four, 
and then go through that process again. Okay, so you're going to refine the mesh in certain areas. You're going to see how it improves. You know, hopefully it, it makes improvement, but if not, you know, you can go back and kind of, you know, change things up a little bit too. Okay. Um, and then just keep repeating that until you end up with a mesh that you're, that you're satisfied with. Okay. Ideally, you should have a mesh that's, that's fully converged, where if you make, if you make, you know, an improvement to an area, you make a refinement, it's not changing the results uh, significantly. So that would be kind of the perfect case where you have mesh convergence. But at the very least, you should at least try to make the areas you know, smoother or try to get to as converged of a, of a stress value as, as you can. Okay, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's go back to some of the uh, meshing controls. And so I think the, the very last thing we covered on Monday was just how the hex dominant method worked. Okay. Uh, let's talk about a couple other methods that you can use in ANSYS to produce a hexahedral mesh. So remember, you know, a hexahedral mesh is, is, is generally preferable. That's, that's kind of the best the mesh that you want uh, for a lot of reasons. And, you know, we've, we've been talking about that for weeks now. Okay? So hex dominant I'd say hex dominant is probably the most common way that people create a hexahedral mesh, um, just because it's, it's pretty automatic. You don't really have to think about it all too much. Okay? But ANSYS comes with a few other methods working. So these methods are, are a little bit more niche, um, but you know, if, if your geometry kind of fits certain, um, certain shapes or certain criteria, these may work better than hex dominant, especially in cases where hex dominant just tends to fail, which is you know, actually quite, quite often. All right, so the first method is called the sweep method. Some of you may have noticed this already in, in ANSYS, we're doing our activities. All right, so the, the way the sweep method works is that it's uh, um, basically ANSYS um, finds one exterior face in your model, one that is you know, very easy to mesh with quadrilaterals. Okay. Quadrilaterals are kind of the two-dimensional version of, uh, of, of the hex. Okay, generally speaking, it's 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 a lot easier to pr produce a quadrilateral mesh on a surface than it is to create a hexahedral. Okay, and that's kind of the motivation behind this uh, this method. So it said, you know, let's start with a quadrilateral mesh. Um, let's do a pure quadrilateral mesh on something, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take that and take that as a stencil, and then kind of propagate that through the rest of your model to make a hexahedral mesh. It looks something like this. And so this is, this is, and so I'm gonna draw kind of like the best case scenario for a sweep. Okay, so let's say that you have an exterior surface on the model that looks exactly like a square, right? And the rest of your model kind of looks something like this. And so let's say that we have kind of a twisty model like this. Okay. 
So let's say that you know we're meshing like a square duct, right? So you know a duct that carries air um, inside a inside a building or something like that. Okay. Okay. So the way sweep works is that it it looks for the surface of your model that that can be most easily meshed with quadrilaterals. And so in this case, we have a perfect face right here. Say this offhand, this is probably one of the most beautiful squares I've drawn on in a lecture before. Be proud of me. My wife is a graphic designer, so she's always making fun of my drawings. Okay. So the way sweep works is that you know it, it it would identify a surface like this, or you can choose you can you can choose which surface to start the sweep from, and then say that you know first mesh this surface through our rules. Okay. And the next thing you're going to do is that, or the next thing that ANSYS is going to do is going to find a path that goes from your starting face or from your seed face until it reaches a target face on another part of the model, right? And so this right here is, you know, kind of the perfect example because if we draw a path here, there's kind of a very nice defined path. And so we draw a path from here all the way to the end, okay? So two, we're going to sweep it. Path to a target face. And then as we're sweeping through, you know, we're basically taking that stencil and we're applying that to the interior mesh. Okay? That's a three stencil used to make. Step four, we end on target face. Right. So the so the mesh you get from from something like this is, is actually beautiful. And so you know, because it's it's kind of a perfect case right here where you know you kind of make a quadrilateral mesh, you mesh it through that stencil. That stencil is nice and uniform and carried out all throughout. And so you end up with a very, very nice mesh. Okay? So sweep works really well when you have a you know, relatively simple geometry. Maybe there's like some mild curvature in the geometry that you know, would make hex dominant a little bit more difficult. Or maybe you want kind of a more uniform mesh than what hex dominant would produce. Okay. Um, you can try sweep in those cases, and then you end up with a very, very nice mesh. Okay. Of course, you know, this, this has a lot of assumptions. And so this assumes the fact that your geometry is simple enough, which is usually not the case for, 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 many, uh, for many geometries. Um, and your, your starting surface you know, has to be relatively flat most of the time. So if you don't have kind of a relatively flat starting surface, this method, you know, doesn't really work. Um, so I'll say, but not. And so kind of the improvement on the, uh, on the sweep method is something called the multi-zone method. So the way multi-zone works is that it's it's basically like a sweep method, but it does multiple sweeps.
right? So it would it so so multi zone would work well would work well in something like this. So let's say that we have kind of a maybe something like this. It's curved up like that. Okay, something like this, maybe. Okay, and so what multi zone would do, and so Ansys does does this, you know, relatively intelligently, is that it kind of breaks up the geometry into different sections that can be swept. So maybe something like this: a sweep, applied to each section. And at the interface, and so of course, you know, all these sweeps are going to meet somewhere. Then all those sections are kind of you know merged together at, at their interfaces. Um, I have a question, Dr. Chan. Sure. Um, is it possible to uh, mesh each of those circles and then combine them to do an assembly of quote unquote these meshes? Yeah, yeah, that's that's possible too. Um, I mean, if they, if they were separate parts, if they if they actually were separate parts in the assembly, um, you could apply different meshing settings to them, and so you can apply you know different sizings, different uh, um, different shapes to them, different orders. Um, and then it would work kind of the same way. But a multi-zone method kind of, ANSYS kind of does this uh, almost automatically. So it kind of tries yeah, to choose. Can you provide just a bit more information? I wanna, I wanna just visualize it in my head. So uh, um, um, I'm, ANSYS just meshes the, each section and mer merges them together at the- Yeah, so the, so the main thing is that they're applying, a, it's applying a sweep to each one. So, you know, for each of the circle sections- yeah, yeah. You know, it, it basically does the exact same thing we did up here. So it identifies, you know, which surface would be good to start with, you know, what would be a good stencil. And so for, you know, this left section here, you know, probably it's going to be this face right here because mm -hmm. it's nice and flat. The only difference would be when it intersects with another of those quote unquote circles. Exactly. Right. I see. Yeah. That sounds good, sir. Yeah, so you know, maybe maybe the sweep paths might look something like this, and so you know, of course, you know, they're all going to meet at some point, and so you know, I think what Ansys does um, is that they uh, they kind of you know mesh that part kind of differently to make sure that all those meshes kind of work work well. Together. Sounds good, sir. Yep. Yeah. So the nice thing about multi zone is that you know you can have multiple sweep paths, and so if there's not just one path that goes through your entire model, um, this might work out better. And you know, for more complicated geometries, this you know this naturally kind of works out better as well. Okay, uh, any questions on uh, a multi zone? Yeah. So these are options you can select? Yes. Yes. So actually, you know, if you use a method, if you use a method object within, uh, within the mesh, you know, the only things that we've done is just either tetrahedron or hex dominant. Sweep and multi zone are also options in that, in that menu too. And when you apply sweep, you just manually you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to manually select. So if you don't manually select, then Antis will choose one, choose one for you. So it'll look basically, you know, Ansys, whenever you apply it to a part, you know, it, it has, it can look at each exterior surface individually. And then, you know, just kind of based on some metrics, you know, based on the curvature and based on the size, um, it'll choose one kind of intelligently to start with and then sweep, sweep from there. So I was trying to understand like uh, selecting multi-zone versus sweep. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So multi, so, you know, um, multi-zone, you would kind of, pick those in kind of more complex cases. So sweep works well, you know, for relatively simple ones where, you know, you can kind of see. So so for sweep works really well when, you know, you can have kind of one path that goes throughout your entire geometry. Um, so multi-zone would look kind of something more like this. We have kind of multiple exterior surfaces and you can kind of envision kind of multiple paths that go, that go through there. All right, any other questions on, um, on this? Okay. All right. So let's uh, so let's go over uh, a couple more settings. So this so we're kind of moving away from hexahedron now. Um, let's talk about the difference between patch conforming and patch independent. Okay. 
So these are also, these are a couple other settings that you can access within ANSYS. And so this is also from the method object, okay? Uh, these are basically settings that you can choose when you have a tetrahedral mesh. So if you have a hex mesh, either hex dominant, sweep, or multi-zone, uh, you won't be able to select these, these two. Okay. And so the first thing, you know, we have to kind of understand in order to understand these, uh, these methods is what is it, what does ANSYS mean by a patch? Okay. So a patch, patch is nothing more than just one of the exterior surfaces of your model. Right, so basically what you're choosing is basically, you know, whether your mesh is going to conform perfectly to the exterior services or if it's going to be independent. From it. Right, and so it, it's, a, it's a pretty, um, you know, it's, it doesn't sound like much of a choice, but, you know, it actually is, makes a big difference in how it, it, it meshes. Okay, so let's do patch conforming first. So the way you can think of patch conforming is that your mesh is basically built from the outside going in. Okay. So what that mean, what I mean by that is that the, you know, when you when you pick a mesh conforming method, the all the patches or all the exterior surfaces of the model are meshed first with triangles. And so you start with kind of the exterior surface and you mesh that first. Okay? And then from there, the mesh is kind of grown inwards uh, to create the tetrahedron. So the benefits to this method, the fact that you start from the outside and go in is the is uh, you're you're guaranteed that your mesh is going to match your geometry exactly. So whatever every single little detail in your CAD file, patch conforming will capture all of it. So a lot of times, you know, that's that's what you want. And so you you know you put a lot of care into making your CAD model as physically accurate as possible, and then um, your patch conforming method is going to you know make sure that you you know you match that. The downside to this method for patch conforming is that you know because you're focused so much on the geometry, a lot less attention is paid towards the mesh quality. So you may and so you may end up with uh, more skewed elements in this case. So the other method that we have is patch independent. And so patch independent, you know, does the opposite. So patch independent kind of grows your mesh from inwards going out. 
All right, so patch independent, what it does is that it first meshes the interior with tetrahedra. So it kind of starts from kind of the, the, mid, the most central point. And so it, it should start from like the centroid of your geometry. Um, and it starts to create tetrahedra from there and then it grows it outwards. Okay. And so this continues, of course, until your elements kind of push past your exterior. And so there's, there comes a point where you add another, you add another tetrahedral and it goes past the boundaries of your CAD file. Okay. And so once it does that, then those, you know, whichever nodes that kind of extend beyond the exterior of your CAD file get projected back onto the CAD file. So that's, that's this method's attempt to kind of, you know, respect the geometry as much as possible. Okay. But that projection method, and so, you know, that method that they use to project back onto the geometry, it's not as perfect as, as kind of the patch independent method. And so what can happen sometimes is that some of the, um, some of the, some of the finer details of the exterior shape of the model may get kind of lost in the mesh and they may get defeatured. So that's one of the downsides of patch independence that you might you might lose some detail that you might find important, especially if your mesh size is fairly large. But the good thing about patch independence is that because you're starting from the interior, you know what ANSYS is going to prioritize is going to produce it's going to prioritize high quality elements, and so you're more likely in this case, or I say much less likely, to produce skewed elements. So if you have a situation, you know, where you have a geometry um, and you have a section of your geometry where you're producing a lot of skewed elements and you think that that's, that's one thing that's kind of polluting your results or making your results not as accurate, you can try doing the patch independent method and see if that improves the quality of the elements and thus the quality of, of your solution. And actually, you know, we'll talk later about just defeaturing de in general, but sometimes, you know, you want that. Sometimes you want to, you know, take some of the finer details on the exterior of your geometry and just kind of, you know, get rid of them because, you know, a lot of times those finer features, they don't really contribute anything structurally to the, uh, to the model um, or even, in, you know, in terms of heat transfer fluid mechanics too. Um, and so sometimes you just want to get rid of them entirely. So patch, doing a patch independent mesh could be kind of a quick way to kind of key feature things that aren't maybe really aren't really that important. Okay. Um, any questions on on this? Yes. Yeah. So patch conforming is the default um, in ANSYS. So if you don't set anything, it's going to be patch conforming. And in fact, if you do hex dominant, then by default, it's going to do patch conforming first. And so it first meshes everything. It first meshes the exterior with triangles. 
then it attempts to combine them to make you know quadrilaterals and, and hexes. Okay. All right, so that's patch conforming, patch independent. So that's that's something definitely useful to have. Um, you know, that may that may help. I know some people are, are struggling with uh, some of the meshing in the project. So, you know, give this a try if, if you're struggling with uh, you know, producing a good mesh. Okay. All right, so let's uh, so let's talk about convergence a bit more, and, and in particular, let's let's compare the convergence behavior um, for different types of meshing techniques. All right, and so we've gone over, you know, quite a few, you know, um, you know, quite a lot of different meshing techniques and ANSYS. And so we talked about, you know, element size, element shape, um, order, you know, all of these things with the different, you know, hex methods and patch conforming, patch independent. And so, you know, let's talk a bit more about how quickly they converge. So the different methods, um, you know, they have their advantages and disadvantages, but you know, we want to see, you know, how quickly they converge onto a simple solution. So for all these plots, I'm going to use uh, the same kind of um, same benchmark. So let's use a benchmark of a of a cantilever beam. So our geometry looks like this. And so we have a three-dimensional beam. We're going to fix it at one end. We have a fixed support here. We're going to apply a load on the other end. So we're going to apply just a vertical force or a bending force at the end, something like that. All right, and so what we're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna show you a bunch of convergence plots and they're all gonna be for the deflection or the deformation of the tip. And so what I have here are a series of kind of you know head-to-head -head battles. Okay? And so you know we're doing we're doing the same simulation throughout, uh, but first let's compare linear tetrahedra versus linear hexahedra. So let's go ahead and make our convergence plot. So on the horizontal axis, we have number of elements. And on the vertical axis, we're going to have tip deflection. Okay, so let's do the linear tetrahedra first. So the linear tetrahedra is going to look like this. Okay. 
So what I want to highlight the most here is kind of where the plot starts. And so for a fairly coarse mesh, we end up with a deflection of about 0 0.3 um, centimeters. Okay. No, I don't remember what exactly what load that we applied, um, but it's, an, it's a load that kind of produces that. And then the max here is going to be 0 0.7 centimeters. Okay. So in the blue right here, we have linear. And the red here, I'm going to have the uh, linear hex. Okay. So based on this plot, you know, you, you, you don't even see, you know, the linear tetrahedra are performing so poorly here that you don't, you, we don't even actually see the convergence of the linear hex. And so, you know, just based on the starting point for the linear tetrahedra, you know, it looks like the linear hex is, is always converged. Okay? And so kind of the upshot for this plot is that linear tetrahedra performs very, very poorly. Not only does it take a long time to converge, but if you look at the difference, and so you know, we're starting from a, a, a deflection of only 0 0.3, and then eventually goes up to 0 0.7, right? So a difference between you know, the low point and the high point is, is huge here. And so that's over two, two times difference. And so, you know, we're starting at 0 0.3 and we end up at 0 0.7. We don't even reach 0 0.7. You know, we can only get up to, you know, maybe about 90, 95% of that, okay? Um, so this is bad. And so, you know, this, this is something that, you know, you know we've, we've kind of hammered in at, at, at several different points throughout this course. But, you know, if you're doing a structural simulation, linear tets are not that good unless you're going to refine it to be, you know, um, fine enough, okay? Okay, so that's the first comparison. And so that one, you know, is pretty, you know, pretty obvious which one is the winner. So you know, linear hex is, is the winner there. Okay. Um, let's look at quadratic tetrahedra versus quadratic hexahedra. So this one's a little bit more of an even match. And so let's draw a convergence plot here. So on the, on the horizontal axis, we're gonna have number of elements. And on the vertical axis, we're gonna have tip deflection. So it looks something like this. And so let me use blue again. The quadratic tetrahedron looks something like this. Okay. And the quadratic hex, you know, might look something like this. Right, so you know this is a lot closer, and so you know you might say that you know this is uh, um, you know these two are, are are more evenly matched. But what I want to draw your attention to is kind of where these plots start. Okay? And so if we look back at the previous plot, you know the linear tetrahedra was starting way way down low, so it's starting at you know zero point three. This starts from zero point seven four millimeters, okay? and then the max here where these two kind of uh, both converge to is 0 0.75 centimeters. Okay. 
So the difference is a lot smaller here. And so you know we're starting at a we're starting at a point even for a relatively coarse mesh, we're starting with a point that's already pretty close to our convergence, um, you know, number. Okay. And so you know making this transition from linear to quadratic, you know, whether you're using tetrahedra or hexahedra, you know, makes a big difference. So that's why, you know, for most of the simulations in the class, in this class, unless you're going to be doing something like heat transfer uh, or fluid mechanics uh, or dynamics too, you know, we'll, we'll use it for dynamics too, you know, you should be using quadratic elements. And so, you know, but just the improvement that you get from that is, is, is um, you know, significant. Okay? And if you'll notice one other thing, so if we compare this graph to our linear graph here, right? And so even for the hexahedra, you know, the linear hexahedra converges at a deformation value of only 0.7 centimeters, right? If you look, and so if you look, you know, these are the exact same boundary conditions, so the exact same load value, the quadratic ones converge at a deflection that's higher. Okay? So deflection amount or deflection maximum. Higher. So the reason for that is because you know linear linear elements, what they tend to do is they tend to underestimate, um, they tend to underestimate the deformation. And so unless, you know, unless you really refine it a lot, um, you know, for structural, for structural FEA, you know, you should be using quadratic elements, okay? Because then you don't have to worry about this underestimation and, you know, you'll reach convergence a lot faster than your, than your linear elements. And so, you know, if, if that's the case, you know, you may be wondering, you know, why do linear elements even exist if they, if they suck so much, right? Um, so linear elements, you know, they, they have their place. Um, you know, I mentioned, you know, they work, they work a lot better in heat transfer and fluid mechanics situations. Uh, and in fact, you know, there's a lot of fluid mechanics algorithms that depend on having linear, um, linear elements. And so, you know, you have um, what can happen in, 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 in fluid mechanics simulations that you can have um, instability. Um, and so there's, there's specific algorithms called stabilization methods that really only work well for, for linear finite elements. And so um, that's kind of where linear had its place. Um, but also, you know, another, another reason why is that ANSYS comes, you know, with a lot of features and, and being able to produce a quadratic mesh, you know, arbitrarily like this on any kind of geometry is, is a luxury. And so, you know, not every software has this. So the fact that ANSYS um, does have it and, it and they package it as kind of like a basic feature is, is not, it's, it's, it's not as trivial as, as, as you may think. And so you know, it's actually quite difficult to make a, you know, an arbitrary quadratic mesh like this. And so, you know, but the nice thing about using ANSYS is that it's, it's available all the time. Um, and so if it's available, you don't know, just use it because it's, you know, it's, it's oftentimes much, much better than, uh, than the linear elements. Okay, okay. any questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so for the last 15 minutes today, I wanna to talk about something called uh, defeaturing. So as, as you work with, you know, 
FEA more. So as you work with ANSYS or other FEA softwares more, you know, one, one thing that you'll discover very quickly is that, you know, the, the bane of your existence in terms of meshing are just tiny, small features on the surface of your CAD geometry. So these are, these are often going to be very difficult to mesh. So some examples that you'll see, you know, often could be, you know, maybe a small shallow imprint on the surface of an object. Okay. Uh, or maybe a, an object with a complex curvature. So maybe you have something like an airfoil where you know you, you can't describe the curvature of an, of an airfoil with just kind of one radius of curvature. And so you have different sections of the um, of the surface, you know, with different areas of curvature. And so what that does is it, you know, the way it those are usually catted up is that those are usually broken down um, into different it, into different sections. Okay. And so trying to mesh geometries like this can be can be difficult. Okay. Especially if you're using, you know, especially if you're using like a patch conforming method where you're trying to match the exterior geometry exactly. Okay. And so one way around this, and so one way to kind of make sure that you produce a good, a good quality mesh is of course to use uh, patch uh, independent. Okay. So if you use a patch independent method, then ANSYS is gonna prioritize you know, producing a good quality mesh over matching your geometry. Okay. Uh, but there's some other things that you can do as well. Okay. So one way. Uh, but of course, you know, if you use patch independent, then you're limited to a tetrahedral mesh. Okay. And maybe you don't want that. Maybe, maybe you want to have the option for hexahedral mesh. Okay. And so there's there's kind of different ways um, around that. Okay, so the, the, the first way is called automatic mesh based defeaturing. So this is a global mesh setting, and so this is something that you can set, you know, from the from the mesh overhead, um, you know, global setting. And so the way this works is that you you basically give ANSYS, and so if you turn this on, you can give ANSYS a length scale, okay. And then um, what the program will do is that it'll automatically ignore any surface features that are, you know, smaller than that length scale.
And so let's say for instance, you know, let's say for instance that you set a, uh, an, the automatic mesh base defeaturing to be you know, one eighth of an inch. And so if you have a surface of your model, so I'm gonna look at kind of a, a cross-sectional cutout of the surface. Okay? And so let's say that you have kind of an imprint in your model like this. But this imprint here is only, you know, let's say one sixteenth of an inch. So this length right here is one sixteenth of an inch. Okay. If you try to mesh this with a, you know, a, a, a mesh, a patch conforming method, or let's say a hex dominant method, you know, what ANSYS is going to do is that you'll, and, and what you'll visually see this too, is that around this kind of indent right here, you're going to have very, very tiny elements. Okay. And so you have elements that look like this. Okay? Well, remember, you know, that, that little indent right there, and, and therefore all of those elements there are only going to be one sixteenth of an inch. And that might be kind of unreasonably small for the geometry that you're looking at. Okay? What you'll see is that the mesh kind of bunches up, bunches up around these small features. Right, so you, a lot of times you don't want that. And so you have basically, you, back, you basically add a lot of mesh density into an area that just doesn't even matter. And so you know, it's not an area of stress concentration. It's not an area of you know, high structural error. Or anything like that. It's just, you know, it just, it's just adding mesh density there because of the geometry. But if you turn on the automatic mesh base to featuring, then ANSYS will recognize this. And so it'll say that, okay, you know, I see the surface feature. I see that is only one sixteenth of an, of an inch deep. But you know, because it's smaller than one eighth, I'm going to ignore this. And so what you get instead, the geometry that looks like this, which just, you know, it just kind of ignores that imprint. So you end up with just a flat geometry just like this. Right? And so with that, you know, maybe you're able to mesh it, you know, much more coarsely. So in here, you know, the imprint used to be kind of right here. Okay. Imprint. Okay. And so now you can, you can mesh it, you know, without those really tiny elements and you can focus that element density on maybe a more important part of your geometry where the stress is, is higher. That's a global setting that you can that you can that we can set. All right, any questions on on this? Okay. All right. So the other feature that I want to talk about uh, has to do with the with has to do with the other example that I did, which is complex curvature, is uh, virtual topology. So virtual topology is, is, a, is, is a nice feature that you can use. It's, it's, not, a, it's not actually a meshing feature. It's actually in the ge geometry feature. Okay. So I believe you can add, you, so I believe you can use this either from design modeler, which is you know the first CAD um, the CAD program that we use for activity one, or space clean, which is the CAD software used for activity four. So the way virtual topology works is that it, you know, if you have kind of a, a weird kind of complex curvature, 
um, you know, you, you create a lot of these kind of contour lines. Okay? Um, and so what virtual topology does is it lets you kind of merge adjacent um, and similar kind of contours together. So let's say that you, you have something like, like an airflow or something, right? So you have something like kind of moon. And so the interior, and so the surface that's kind of facing you out here is a, is a, is a concave surface, right? And so if you have kind of the radius of curvature kind of varying along that, along that path, you, know, you may produce a geometry that looks like this, okay? Where there, there's not actual lines on your geometry, but the fact that the radius of curvature is changing as you go along means that it's going to produce a surface that looks like this. Okay? So each of these surfaces, you know, is each of these are, are clickable, basically. And so if you mesh this. So whenever, whenever ANSYS sees kind of a separation in, in a surface like this, or you know, a clickable surface, you know, as, as you go from one to the other, it thinks that that is a hard boundary, okay? And so what you end up with, you know, is a mesh that kind of looks, it kind of looks a little bit weird. So it doesn't, doesn't really match that curvature exactly. I'm sure, yeah. So, so this example here, you know, you have a geometry here where, you know, the curvature, the radius of curvature is kind of changing all inside this interior surface, right? So visually what you can see is that this kind of interior surface right here is it's all it's all one surface right so it should it should all be kind of meshed together but because the radius of curvature is changing then ansys thinks it's actually you know four surfaces all kind of together right and so since the surface just and, and this is a, a this is a result from the cat file and so since the cat file kind of breaks up the surface into four right here what you end up with is that you can actually visually see those those kind of breaks in your mesh. And so you know, maybe it's something like this. So I'm gonna do kind of an extreme case. So you know, maybe we, we mesh this one with hexahedra. It's ugly. And then maybe in the one adjacent to that, you know, when it when it kind of sees that break. You know, maybe it does this one with triangles okay. or tetrahedron. Okay. And so it looks off. And so you have kind of these kind of weird kind of slats to your, to your mesh that you don't really, they're not very desirable. Okay. And so what virtual topology does is that, you know, if you, if you know that this entire surface right here should be one, right, it kind of gets rid of these extra contour lines. And so, Instead, what you can do is you can do virtual topology. And then, you know, what you can do is you can basically click all these surfaces here and kind of merge them all into one. So effectively kind of defeaturing this a little bit. And so you kind of get rid of those, those lines. Okay? So now you have kind of nice one even surface. It's still, it's still curved. But you know, ANSYS will recognize it as just a single surface, right? Right. And so when you go to mesh this, you know, visually it's going to look a lot better. And so it's going to look a lot smoother. Right? So maybe you know, maybe you can do everything here with kind of a, a hex mesh. And you end up, you just kind of naturally end up with a much more higher quality of this in this case. Okay? And so if you compare these two, right? So let me zoom out just so you can see, right? In the top case, you know, because we have those kind of weird contour lines, you know, you might get kind of weird breaks and, and kind of weird slats in the geometry. And usually at the interface of these kind of surfaces right here, you end up with kind of poor quality of this. And so to avoid that, you know, you can combine those. And so you can combine kind of uh, adjacent surfaces that you know should be kind of one um, surface 
um, and then make a better quality mesh from, from that. Okay. All right, um, any questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so it's 8.13. Um, there is one more thing um, as part of this uh, lecture notes and that's volume-based refinement. Um, but I think I'll save that for Monday just because you know, I, don't, I definitely can't cover in two minutes, right? All right, so thank you guys for coming today. Um, you know, um, definitely, you know, make sure you're working on the activity, make sure you're working on the midterm project. You know, come ask me if you have any questions. You know, I, I think I've already talked to quite a few, quite a few, a few of you in the class. So, you know, definitely, you know, don't be afraid to come, uh, come ask. Okay? And so hope you guys have a good weekend. Um, uh, can we have a day to work on the midterm project in class? I don't think we have time for that because, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we, we, we at least do activity five before we go on break. Um, and so I don't think we'll have time for it, but, you know, I'll see, I'll, you know, we'll see how you guys are next week, where you guys are, and, and, and you know, maybe, maybe not a full lecture, but, you know, maybe, maybe like half a lecture, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay. All right, so thank you guys for coming today. I uh, hope you guys enjoy your weekend, and then I'll see you next week. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Thanks, Ivan. Professor, I had a quick question. Uh, yes. do, you, do you have time right now? Yeah, or? yeah, I have time right now. Okay. Uh, I have a, can I, is it okay if I can share my screen?